Good morning, folks, and welcome to church. Take your hymnals, please, and turn over to page number 439. And when you have found your place, if you're able to stand, stand with us, please, for verse number four of Stepping in the Light, number 439. Trying to walk in the steps of the Savior, upwards till upward will follow our guide. When we shall see him again in a duty, happy, how happy a place at his side. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, stepping in the light, stepping in the light. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, led in path of light. Good morning, folks. Thanks so much for being a part of our Sunday morning service, and thank you for those of you that are tuning in online. We've got a choir special for you this morning, so we're going to go ahead and pray. We'll get right into the services. Thanks for coming. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be in your house again, Lord, on this Sunday morning. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the absolutely beautiful weather, Lord, we're getting to enjoy, Lord, and, and uh, just being able to meet together for fellowship, Lord, and worship of you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Father, Lord, I pray now as we uh, get into these services, Lord, that you'd speak to our hearts, Lord, whether it be in the youth service or primary church or right here in this auditorium. Lord, let your will be done. Lord, we give you the praise, the glory, the honor. We pray these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. God of truth and blessing, 
Thank you, folks. Take your hymnals, please, and turn over to page number 77. Page number 77. Oh, that will be glory, number 77. When all my labors and trials are o'er, and I am safe on that beautiful shore, just to be near the dear Lord I adore, will fill the angels be glory for me. Oh, that will be glory for me. When we all get to heaven, number 78. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansion bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing there will be When we all say Jesus We'll sing and shout the victory While we walk the pilgrim pathway Clouds will overspread the sky But when traveling days are over not a shadow, not a sigh. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing there will be. Oh, when we all say Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day just one glimpse of him in glory will the cause of life repay when we all when we all get to heaven what a day what a day of rejoicing and for me when we all when we all say jesus will sing and shout the victory When we all get to heaven, 
that will be. Amen. All right, well, let's go over a few announcements. Who needs a bulletin this morning? If you need a bulletin, raise your hand. We'll make sure to get one to you. All right. One of those bullhorns, yeah. All right. Well, grab your uh, bulletin. We'll go to the inside of the bulletin. Thank you so much for being a part of our church services on this Sunday morning and whenever you're able to. And then again, thank you for those of you that are tuning in online. Uh, missionary Spotlight this evening will be the Brian Johnson family, uh, missionaries to Brazil. Uh, please pray for Rebecca Johnson's health. Uh, that is their prayer request, and you'll get a little bit of an update in regards to that uh, this evening as we go through uh, the, uh, the missionary spotlight. In a couple weeks, uh, we will have, uh, I, I think many of you are aware that Brother Wales went on a trip to Bulgaria. I've asked Brother Wales to put a pre presentation together. Uh, so on July 10th, uh, on a Sunday evening, we'll have a presentation by Brother Wales in regards to his trip and just giving an update of uh, his experience there in Bulgaria. You know, one of the things I love about uh, having individuals do that, if they're able to, is that we get a firsthand account, you know, of those that have been there. And he's got pictures and such that he's going to share. Uh, so I did want to make you aware of that. We were actually going to do it tonight, but due to uh, circumstances with specials and things like that, and then next week being a holiday and having a lot of specials on the holiday, we pushed it to the 10th in that evening. But something to be considering. Uh, I'd encourage you to be here that Sunday night and encourage you to be here any Sunday night you can. Uh, as we do uh, read letters and give missionary updates, uh, whether in person or by the letters that we read. Uh, and you should, you should want to hear the reports. You should want to know what's going on with our missionaries. Uh, we, uh, and I've, made, I've put this out here. It's been a long time since I made this announcement. If you're interested in reading any of the missionary letters for specific missionaries, as they come in, I have each and every one of those. You know, so I can give you those updates. I, I can uh, photocopy them for you. Um, the, several of our missionaries, if you're interested in getting their emails, they'll send you their emails and even give Facebook updates. Uh, we get uh, quicker updates through Facebook and social media from some of our missionaries than we do on a monthly basis for some of their letters. So just, again, giving you all this information uh, for your benefit if you'd like to keep updated with each and every one of our missionaries that we support. But tonight we will be reading Brian Johnson, his family's missionary letter, as they are missionaries, one of our missionaries to Brazil. Uh, let's see here. Did you like the church funny this week? You know, how many of you love, love telemarketers? Raise your hand. <laughs> you know, I've found most telemarketers now aren't even a person anymore. They're a robot. You know, uh, they're not even doing that. How many of you have ever done telemarketing? Anybody in here like that's done telemarketing? Me, the, I'm the only one that's had to go through both sides of the pain. You know, I did telemarketing for eight months. You know, maybe even called some of you. Anybody got a, tele, a telemarketing phone call in regards to signing up for Discover Card? That might have been me. Uh, but anyways, I did call a lot of the East Coast, you know, when I was in college. Uh, but anyways, I thought that was funny. Uh, you know, please be good to people. Good, be good to telemarketers. You know, I know that they can be an annoyance. <laughs> yes, give them the give them gospel. Yeah, that's a good way to get them to, to hang up on you. Yeah, they'll hang up on you if you give them the gospel. Anyways, it's meant to be a funny. It's not meant to give you ideas. You know, Brother Johnson, specifically speaking to you. You know, and I know you've got that, that side to you. Uh, but anyways... Uh, yeah, I just thought that was comical to me. Anyways, uh, going through the uh, other announcements, church schedule, Sunday morning, we do have 930 Sunday school for those of you who'd like to participate in that. Uh, every Sunday morning, 1045 a.m. service with an evening service at 6 p.m. Tonight, there is no choir practice. Tonight will be our, our band practice because we will have a band special tonight during our evening service. Wednesday evening, this coming Wednesday evening, we will have a uh, a pause to uh, the Bible study when it comes down to relationships. This Wednesday evening, uh, Brother Gelno is going to be filling the pulpit as I will be at camp. So please be in prayer uh, for, what's that? Sweltering. Sweltering, yes. It's supposed to be hot. Hot, hot, hot at camp this week over there. It's actually be cooler here than there. Uh, but pray for us, uh, myself, a couple other uh, adults, and of course we've got five uh, youth that will be there uh, with us uh, at Teen Camp. Pray for safe traveling mercies. We'll be leaving tomorrow this church property by 10 a.m. So 10 a.m. tomorrow morning, I'll be, we'll be leaving here uh, to go out to uh, New Hampshire, uh, Singing Hills Camp uh, for New England Baptist Teen Camp. 
So be in prayer for that. Be in prayer uh, that God will work on the hearts of those individuals that are going uh, as we are going to enjoy week at camp. Uh, church barbecue this coming Sunday, a week from today, uh, we will have our 4th of July weekend barbecue. Uh, there are plenty of areas to sign up for for that. If you haven't signed up already for an area that you'd like to, to help out in when it comes down to providing of food items, uh, we will provide the main dish uh, and, of course, all the cutlery and plates and napkins and such uh, for that event. So uh, please be here next week for that, and then invite someone to be a part of it as well. Ladies' activity, July 8th, for those of you who uh, want to be a part of that activity, I believe it's going to be Fielder's Choice. Uh, so my wife had planned, to, it's, we're getting into that season where, hey, you know, as it gets warmer, ice cream just sounds so much better. I know for some of you, it's like, ice cream sounds good all the time. That's my wife, not me. I, I go through seasons of it. Uh, but ladies, uh, there'll be an activity to Fielder's Choice. Uh, my wife, I'm sure, will have information set up for that, but I believe just everybody's going to meet over there and leave from there afterwards uh, just for a great time of fellowship there at Fielder's Choice right here in Brunswick. But ladies' activity, July 8th, we'll give you the, more information regards the time and such for that. Youth activity, July 22nd. So that'll be the next opportunity for the youth activity in July. And then our next family fun night, July 29th. We went through, I believe, just over 50 burgers on, uh, on uh, a Friday night. Uh, so I was actually very, very surprised how many that we went through. Uh, but great, great fellowship, great spirit, great time at our family fun night. So this next family fun night, we'll give you some more information in regards to as to what we'll be doing. Uh, it will be hot dogs this time. We're not doing burgers this time around. Uh, but we had a great, great time at our last family fun night and encourage you to be here for the next one. Church business report for May is available on the Back Usher station. So if you'd like to see uh, the direction our finances have gone over the last month, I'd encourage you to pick up one of those. Uh, so that are, those are back there. We did have a very, very good uh, month during the month of May. You know, so thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness to giving. Uh, I, I'll give you this as well. I was telling our deacons and a few others, when we replace the gym lights in the gymnasium, we have now had that uh, now for, I believe, just over a month, our electric bill went down $50 just from replacing the lights in there. You know, so that is, that is a huge, huge, huge deal. If you figure 12 months out of the year, 50 bucks savings, that's, that adds up. You know, so praise God for that. You know, I didn't we don't realize how much power we're using until we do something like that. Yeah, that's, that's great, great savings. So just wanted to give you those things to make you aware that we're trying to do our best. Uh, we're asking God to give us wisdom as to how to better be efficient with what he's given us. You know, so if you'd like to see the financial report, that is back there for your convenience. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask, and I will answer those as they come in. Other available services on Sunday morning, primary church, four years old, the second grade, Youth service, 3rd to 12th, and then a nursery is available for any of our church services here at our property. Soul winning, ladies, Thursdays, 9.30 a.m., and then anyone else who'd like to go uh, to our church-wide soul winning time, Saturday, 10.15 a.m. departure. All right, that is it for the announcements. I don't believe I've missed any, so at this time we'll have our ushers come forward for the morning offering. And Mr. Warner, if you pray for the morning offering, sir. services this morning. Give us something from your message, dear Lord. And I ask you, Lord, to please bless this offering as we finance your work here, getting the gospel to the area.
Thank you, Nathan, for the offertory. Take your hymnals, please. Turn to page number 79. Number 79, where the rose never fades. Number 79. Going to a city where the streets with gold are laid, where the tree of life is blooming, and the roses never fade. Here they bloom but for a season. Soon their beauty is decay. I am going to a city where the roses never fade. In this world we have our troubles, Satanists we must evade. We'll be free from all temptation where the roses never fade here they bloom but for a season soon their beauty is decayed i am going to a city never fade. Loved ones gone to be with Jesus in their robes of white array. Now we're waiting for my coming with the roses never fade. They bloom but for a season Soon their beauty will decay I am going to a city Where the roses never fade And for our last hymn, page 80 Once you've found your place, if you're able to stand, stand with us, please <clears throat> Youth services, junior church, staff can be excused at this time. We'll never grow old, number 80. I have heard of a land on the faraway strand. Tis a beautiful home of the soul. Built by Jesus on Oh, 
voice with will bend Or will the loved ones who gone on before Never go, will never go In a land where we'll never go Okay, take your Bibles, please. Turn to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 7. I told a preacher, the older I get, the more I like that song. <laughs> I think one of the reasons that happens, I was just thinking about it, is, is that, you know, as you, you lose this ability, you lose that ability, and you can't do this anymore, and you can't do that anymore, heaven starts looking really, really good. And trade this old piece of, piece of junk in for a new vehicle, amen? <laughs> okay. Enough of that entertainment now. Luke chapter 7. We're going to be reading verses 36 through 50. Luke 7, 36 through 50. I'll read the even-numbered verses on my own. Join me, please, on the odd-numbered verses and the last verse also, please. And I think we're ready to go, so here we go. Luke chapter 7. 36 through the end of the chapter. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee, which had bidden him, saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered, said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. And there was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed him five hundred pence, and the other fifty. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom was gave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loveth much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he saith unto her, thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he saith unto the woman, thy faith hath saved thee, go in peace. And now let's pray. Father, I pray you'd help us to be stilled in our hearts and to pay attention to the word of God being preached. Help us to hear with the kind of hear you speak of in the Bible where we hear with the intent to obey. And we ask for your help in this. Amen. Okay, you may be seated. All right, we've got an interesting passage of scripture this morning. Uh, this is an instance of Jesus again interacting with individuals, uh, individuals, and interestingly, that are part of the religious culture. You have an individual by the name of Simon that is mentioned here. You have an individual that uh, is of ill repute, if you will, that is mentioned here. And uh, of course, Jesus teaches a great, great lesson. The title of my message this morning is A God of Great Worth. 
a God of great worth. Uh, Jesus has just responded to the messengers. To kind of give you some background here, Jesus has just responded to the messenger, messengers sent by John the Baptist. John the Baptist is currently in prison. And John the Baptist sent messengers uh, as he was doubting whether Christ was really who he said he was. And, and he sent them to find out, hey, are you really who you know, we, you, we think you are or are we waiting for someone else? Jesus, uh, after that, uh, then addresses the hard-hearted Pharisees in response to John and also in response to himself, meaning Christ. And likely the same audience we find in this passage one of the Pharisees by the name of Simon makes a request of Jesus to eat with him. You know, we don't really get a complete understanding as to why. Maybe it was, hey, this guy's popular. Maybe some of his popularity will rub off on me. You know, if I have him over for a meal, you know, it doesn't matter. He just, hey, he invites him over and uh, has that time with him. And, and Jesus accepts the invitation. You know, upon sitting down to eat, a, a woman of ill repute brought an alabaster box of, of ointment. You know, interestingly, this is a separate event from the one that you find in Matthew chapter 26, verse 6, where the alabaster box is, is, is uh, broken and, and the ointment is poured upon his head, you know, uh, where Jesus had that ointment put on him. You know, this woman, we can assume, came uninvited. You know, uh, came uninvited to the Pharisee's meal, implied by her tears and, uh, and the wiping of them with her hair and the kissing of Jesus' feet and anointing them with ointment, we can see that she... Uh, I had a, a great heart of repentance prompted by uh, a, a guilty and tender heart. Jesus, seeing the heart of Simon, the Pharisee, addresses this man with a story of forgiveness. Asking Simon a question regarding the story he has just heard, and then Jesus refer, refers back to the woman. He uses a teaching time for Simon and those that are there. On, on how uh, she showed great care of him when Simon did not. You know, to help you understand the culture here, it was very common in culture for if someone was invited over, they offer them a basin, a basin of water to wash their feet. You know, today you think that that's kind of odd. You know, when was the last time we offered anybody a basin of water to wash their feet when they came over to our house? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's basically, yeah, in some cultures, like, okay, Japan, for example, you take your shoes off at the door. You don't go any further. You know, it, it, that floor, they don't let you walk across it. It's, it's, it's a, uh, without, you know, with shoes on. It's part of their culture. In this culture, you know, a lot of them wore sandals. Dust gets on your feet. Your feet get dirty. It was a common courtesy. Yet, Simon didn't offer that common courtesy. Well, how do we know that? Because Jesus addressed it. Jesus addressed with the fact, hey, Simon, you didn't, you didn't offer me any water. Yet, this woman here has washed my feet, you know, with her tears. Hey, you didn't even greet me with a kiss. You know, I'd say, whoa, that's, that's even more weird. I mean, when was the last time you greeted someone? And now when we think about, you know, a kiss in, in American culture, it's not the same as it is in even European culture today. It was a greeting, you know, uh, a kiss on each cheek, if you will, just a greeting of, hey, I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for coming. Yet, that would not, there was no such courtesy. There was no such greeting. You know, we see that Jesus, uh, uh, you know, uh, also see that the story is, is one of God's mercy being shown to a humble, repentant sinner while rendering little to the hard-hearted, self-righteous, religionist. You know, moreover, in so making his point, Jesus forgave a sinful person, clearly illustrating salvation through faith. We see that at the very last verse in verse number 50 of Luke chapter 7, where he addresses the woman. He says, thy faith hath saved thee. Hey, go back to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. By grace are ye saved through what? Faith. So we see a story here of salvation being illustrated through faith in this woman's life. Now, I, I read a story in regards to the Titanic, and you know, I, I've read lots of stories in regards to you know, before the Titanic was shipped, but, you know, be, be, you know, while it was being made and after it sank and all the lots and lots of things that go along with it. But uh, what was most wanted when the Titanic sank, there was a story about that. You know, on April 14, 1912, 
at 10 p.m. So what was most wanted by those individuals uh, uh, that, you know, would have been getting off the Titanic? If you think about that, you know, uh, most of the time people are there, my life is the most important. But there, there's always that one individual that, hey, I, I've got to take this with me. I can't leave this here. You know, uh, on April 14th, 1912, 10 p.m., the Titanic crashed into an iceberg in the mid-Atlantic. And four hours later, sunk. Took four hours for it to sink. You know, uh, one, one woman in a lifeboat, a lifeboat asked if she could go back to her room. Can you imagine being the individual she's asking? Are you nuts, lady? You know, we're going down and you want to go back to your room and take a chance of, of dying? You know, she was given only three minutes to do so. You got three minutes. <laughs> you know, three minutes to get back here. She hurried down the corridors, already tilting dangerously through the gambling room, piled ankle deep in money. In her, in her room were her treasures waiting to be taken. But instead, she snatched up three oranges and hurried back to the boat. One hour before, she would have naturally chosen diamonds over oranges. But in the face of death, values are seen more clearly. You know, in the face, hey, I, I don't know how long I'm going to be on the boat. You know, that day, hey, food was more valuable than the gems that, you know, were, could have been there in the room. You say, what, what's the point of you using this illustration this morning? We all put values on things. We all put values on things. We see that from the story. You know, the, you have to understand the, the ointment that was used was a precious ointment. It was not something that was, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 it was not cheap. You know, and the value that that woman showed to Jesus Christ, she showed that he was much more valuable than the individual who invited, Simon who invited Jesus Christ, not even showing him just common courtesies of care. We all put values on things. Sometimes devaluing or misvaluing something that is worth so much more than we could have understood. This is how many of us maybe treat God. You know, and again, I don't know if this is you. I know in my own life, I can look at my life and think, you know what, there was a time in my life where I devalued God. Didn't look at him as being important. Didn't look at my relationship with him as being important. You could say priorities were, you know, all messed up. You could say, hey, uh, it could have been a part of immaturity. It doesn't matter what excuse you put to it. At the very least, it was a matter of, you know what? God didn't have value to me at the time. That brought me to a question this week as I was reading this, this passage of Scripture. You know, how much do I value God? How much do we value God. You know, I want to give you some observations of Simon, the sinful woman, and, and then Jesus in regards to uh, this passage. Number one, look back with me and stay here in Luke chapter number seven, and we're going to look at a few verses here, just some things that uh, may help you with uh, value. Value God. Number one, value starts with desire. Value starts with desire. Verse number 37 of our text passage. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. You know, again, alabaster, if in my understanding is correct, is a type of stone. You know, and alabaster is a, is a beautiful, beautiful uh, type of stone. You know, a, a, a box that was probably of great worth. You know, with ointment that was very, very, very precious. We see here that this woman had a desire to get to the Savior. You know, one of the things that's interesting about this story is the fact that we, uh, we get a good understanding that she wasn't invited, that she didn't care. Hey, I don't, I'm not invited. I need to get to Jesus. You know, everybody there, I'm sure, seeing her is like, what is going on? Is he going to address this? Is, you know, Simon is saying, hey, if, if he really was a prophet, then, you know, he would know what type of woman she is. Shows Simon's heart. You know, Simon, you know, had a high value of himself. Yet we see a woman that 
had great desire to get to Jesus. She valued getting to him. The word desire means this. Desire is, an in, is that internal act which by influencing the will makes us proceed to action. Makes us proceed to action. Our desires influence us to proceed to action. I'll give you an example of this. In my own life, when I was uh, probably, I would think I was getting, oh, sophomore, maybe in high school, uh, back when iPods first came out. Everybody remembers when, you know, the iPods looked like a brick. They literally were a brick. The things were indestructible, practically. Uh, but I, I, the iPods had first come out, and I'd wanted one, and I went and got one. About four months later, iPod video came out, you know, on a screen about that big. You know, I think, man, that's, that, you know, you know I, at the time, now I'm looking back thinking, what kind of a fool was I, you know, needing that? And I, I told my mom, I was working a job at that time, and, you know, I, I told my mom, Dad, I want to get one. And my dad said, you don't need it. He goes, hey, you don't, you don't, uh, 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 you, you don't need that. You already got one. And well, well, this one can, you don't understand, this one can do this. You know, <laughs> you know how teenagers, you know, think, you know, and even sometimes as adults, we think that way. I use that, at, and I, ended, I did end up getting it and regretted it later, uh, to make a long story short, but I use it as an illustration to help you understand our desires can drive us to make decisions. Our desires can cause us to act in good ways and cause us to act in, in wrong ways. And in this case, this woman's desire uh, got her to Jesus. She valued Jesus in such a way, desired to be uh, near him in such a way uh, that she was moved to action. Value starts with desire. John chapter 4, verses 7 through 15, the Bible says this, There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou being a Jew askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is, that saith to thee, Give me to drink. Basically, if you knew who was speaking to you right now, who, asked, uh, who, who uh, uh, says, Give me to drink, thou would ask of him, and he would, get, uh, would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself, and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. Hey, he's talking about the well. Hey, whosoever drinks of this water, they're going to get thirsty again. You know, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Here's the woman's response. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. After this interaction with the Samaritan woman, the Samaritan woman talking with Jesus, you see a change. You see a realization, hey, I need this water. Desire led her to ask. One of the things you don't see here in this story is you don't see the woman say, oh, okay, well, thank you so much for telling me about that. And then her go on her way. No, she hears Jesus and, and her response is as such that desire to have what he was talking about led her to ask, sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Obviously, Jesus Christ was not talking about a physical water in the sense of a water drawn out of a well, but he was giving her spiritual truths that she would have understood. Because the Samaritans, even though they were considered, uh, they were looked down upon by Jews and, and also, you know, the Greeks, they still read scripture. They still uh, were looking for a Messiah just like the quote unquote full blooded Jews were. Value starts with desire. Psalm 37, verse 4, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Hey, do you remember the day that you got saved? 
You remember the day that someone sat down with you maybe, or, or maybe you yourself went through Bible and God revealed to you, you know, how you can receive him as your personal savior. You know, I, I remember, you know, as I, when I got assurance of my salvation, I often have given my testimony of when I was five years old, my dad shared with me the gospel for the first time. But I got assurance of my salvation as a teenager. And at that time, I was pretty rebellious in my heart. And I remember a pastor asked me a question. He said, he, he, he said Chad, if you were to die today, uh, do you know uh, uh, 100% sure that heaven will be your home? And at, at that time, I had admitted to him that I remembered, you know, my dad sharing something with me, but I don't remember the decision I had really made and, you know, or even the sincerity of my heart. But I even followed up with a response to this individual and said, well, you know, how can anybody know that? Hey, do, and I even kind of push it back on him. You know, I said, well, do, you know, do you know that? You know, you know, almost like trying to reversal the question. Of course, it backfired on me in that, in that case in a good way. And he said, I do. He goes, has anybody ever shared with you from the Bible how you can know for sure that heaven would be your home? And I said, well, again, I remember my dad sharing with me some things from the Bible as a five-year-old, but I don't remember much from that. He said, well, would you like to know? And of course, my response was, well, you've got my interest peaked. I've got a desire to know. I'll, I'll hear you out. And then, of course, he went through the scripture, and at the very end, you know, I got assurance of my salvation. Do you remember the desire you had in your heart to want to know? Hey, do you remember the desire in your heart to want to have that gift of eternal life after hearing about it? Value starts with the desire. Value starts with the desire. Hey, do you desire uh, uh, God's salvation? Do you desire a relationship with him? You know, I go back to the dating aspect. You know, uh, all, those of us that are married in here or, or have dated. You know, I, when you, and even now, you know, I look at it even from the married standpoint. Yeah, you know, desire to be around your spouse, a desire to be around your loved one. You know, hey, that desire leads to value. Hey, I value you much so. You know, you go to the engagement aspect of the relationship. You know, I, I, I got engaged at Fogo de Chao. How many of you know I've ever been to a Fogo de Chao? Anybody been to a Fogo de Chao? How many of you been to a Brazilian, all-you-can-eat Brazilian steakhouse? Anybody been to one of those? Okay, a couple of you. That's, that's what Fogo de Chao is. You know, it's an all-you-can-eat Brazilian steakhouse. They got a, an elaborate, huge, huge uh, uh, buffet, salad buffet that's there. And, uh, and, and, of course, they're hoping that you're going to fill up on that so that you don't eat, you know, a bunch of meat. You know, we went to that, and I looked at the buffet and said, man, it looks great, but I didn't come here for rabbit food. You know, I came here for the rabbit, you know, <laughs> if you will. You know, they don't, they don't, set, they don't give rabbit there, but, uh, man, they had all different types of meat, filet and, you know, of course, uh, you know, lamb and all kinds of stuff. Great, man, phenomenal restaurant. Haven't been back since. You know, but anyways, I, I decided and, you know, to make, you know, I, uh, my wife, I'd always told her, you know, when we were dating, you know, I, I, I will never, 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 you know, uh, 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 propose to you in front of your, your family. So she had no clue, you know, that that was what was going to happen. But anyways, we went to the restaurant and, you know, uh, you know, of course, I'm nervous and it's packed out there and, and went through the whole, you know, night. And at the very end, I ended up proposing to my wife. And at that time, you know, I, uh, of that proposing and bringing all that that up uh, for a reason of, of value. When you propose, you especially in our culture, you usually give an engagement ring. You know, to show, hey, I value you so much, you know, uh, this is the way I'm showing you how much I value you. Or at the very least, hey, I value you so much, I want to spend the rest of my life with you. You know, I don't ever, uh, I don't want to, I, I want you exclusively, if you will. That's essentially what you're saying to the individual, if you're the man and the woman accepting it, saying that to the man through the acceptance. But value starts with desire, desiring a, a relationship. Do we desire God in such a way? Desire God in such a way for salvation. Desire God in such a way uh, that uh, we'd want a relationship with him that, that, with him. that desire shows value. Number two, worth is shown by action. Worth is shown by action. Verse 38, this woman and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with, her, with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. What a humble, humble gesture. 
what a, 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 a repentant showing of, of how much this woman wanted and desired Christ in her life. Worth is shown in action. Yeah, you know, I, I remember as, as a kid, uh, my grandpa Duclo, he, he uh, uh, died many years ago now, uh, but he had a Lincoln town car. And if I remember correctly, it was a Forest Green Lincoln town car. And uh, my, it, the story is told, and I've actually even seen him do this, that he'd wash that car every single day. Didn't drive it every single day, but he washed it. He had a routine he'd go through, and he'd wash it pretty often. Pretty often. You know, worth is shown in action. He valued that vehicle so much, he wanted to make sure it was taken care of. You know, this woman, you know, uh, uh, showed great worth to Jesus by action of, hey, I, 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 I you know, uh, uh, washing his feet with her tears and hair. And you think, man, that's, that's kind of gross. Yet, it was her heart. Seeing Jesus, believing, believing that he was who he said he was, her, her heart was moved. Worth is shown by action letter A, by showing meekness. We see that in the humbleness of this woman. The humbleness. Luke chapter 18, verse 9 through 14, And he spake this parable unto a certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Man, Jesus taught some parables to some people that were rough. You know, these individuals, they, they thought themselves to be righteous. They despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. There, there, you get an understanding. A prideful individual. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humble himself shall be exalted. You know, we can see a lot in the New Testament in regards to a humble spirit. A humble spirit. The fact that God uh, resists the proud. The Bible tells us God resisteth the proud. This woman does not show any pridefulness, but the exact opposite. Humbles herself. To wash Jesus' feet with her tears and her hair. Folks, can you imagine? She's essentially humiliating herself in front of all these other individuals that are watching that go on. Yet she sought Jesus. with such, She had a desire to get to Jesus with such great value. She showed humbleness towards him. Another way to show worth by action is not just humbling ourselves but by serving, by serving. Verse 44, And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, and thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Hey, she did a service for Christ. She essentially showed a, 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 a service, a, a, a serving him giving of time. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It's reasonable for us. Yeah, think about all that God has done for us. God, God has done so much for us. Wouldn't it not be reasonable for us to serve him? Now, I'm not essentially saying that service is just in the church itself, but serving others for his sake. 
this woman essentially showed by action the worth she was she found in Jesus by the giving of her time. She sought him. She served him by the cleaning of his feet. Yet Simon, on the other hand, didn't even bother to give him the common courtesy of, 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 of a basin to wash his feet in, a common courtesy of a greeting. Let her see uh, another uh, another way uh, is a giving of affection. Verse number 45, Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. <laughs> she wasn't just giving him a greeting, if you will, and of course it wasn't common for someone to kiss another individual's feet. Feet are dirty. <laughs> to be honest with you, yeah, they're, they're gross. You know, uh, yet we see great humbleness and great affection, great affection shown through this woman towards Jesus. First John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18, Hereby we perceive the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But all, whoso hath this world's good and Seeth his brother hath need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him. How dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Basically saying, hey, let's love by action. Let's love by action. The giving of, of affection. Affection that was shown. You know, this passage here is not teaching you that you should go kiss someone else's feet. That's not what it's showing. You know, we can see that great affection is showed towards Jesus Christ. Great worth is shown to God incarnate by that giving of affection. One of the ways we can show affection to God through the giving of affection is to love one another as he has loved us. How about through giving or investing Verse 46, my head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Again, another common courtesy, not just the washing of feet, but also another common courtesy was uh, uh, to giving of some ointment, sweet smelling uh, oils uh, or ointments. Yet that was not shown, that courtesy to Christ from Simon, but this woman through giving. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9, Honor the Lord with thy substance, and with the fruit, first fruits of all thine increase. Honor means to esteem due, the esteem due or paid to worth, high estimation. The, one of the greatest things that this woman could have done is show, to show value is to put that ointment on his feet. Hey, she had something that she had invested her own money in and then used it for Christ. Yeah, remember back in Matthew chapter 26, which we had briefly mentioned, the woman who, you know, broke the alabaster box and pointed the ointment around his head, and, and there was some of the disciples that, uh, you know, had, had uh, uh, I, mean, I don't remember if it was within themselves or verbally complained one or the other, the fact, hey, this could have been sold and given to the poor. And what does Jesus tell them? The poor, you have all, you, you all have the poor always, but you don't have me. You won't have me always. This woman had hey, wrought a great deed, preparing his body for, you know, his, his burial. That would, be, would essentially happen. J.L. Kraft, most of you have probably heard that name, at least Kraft. He's the head of the Kraft Cheese Corporation, if you like Kraft Cheese. But anyways, he said this, the only investment... I ever made, which has paid consistently increasing dividends, is the money I have given to the Lord. You know, JR, this is, we're talking about the founder of the craft company. He said, hey, all the investments I've made, he said, the one that I've seen consistently and dividends from is what I've given to God. Hey, what have we given to God? Again, I, I, it, it could be monetary, financially. It could be our time. I believe time is more precious sometimes than money. Then obviously, you know, money's necessary. It's a tool to be used. But one of the ways we could show our, our, how much we value God is through giving, time, substance. 
Number three, it's number one. Value starts with a desire. Number two, worth is shown in action. Number three, belief leads to great value. Belief leads to great value. Verse 39, now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. He immediately, you could see this man's heart towards Jesus Christ. Then we see at the end of the chapter, verse 49, and they, they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, who is this that forgiveth sins also? Now they question, question Jesus. Question Jesus, how, how can he forgive sins? You know, if this man really truly were a prophet, then he would know that this woman is touching him. He would do something about it, essentially. Belief leads to great value. Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 17. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Hey, uh, who? Whom do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. You know, if you think about the disciples' lives and, and you look at it, you know, it's hard not to see the fact that they valued Christ so much so that even after he ascended back to heaven, they uh, allowed themselves to be martyred for Christ's cause. They didn't turn their back on him. They valued him very much so. In a very hostile time where people were being put to death for preaching Christ. Now, I think that's hard for us to understand as Americans because we don't see that here in America. You know, we don't have to fear coming to a building like this to meet together, to worship and, 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 uh, God and, and open up his word. We don't have to fear someone coming into our home and rifling through all of our goods to see if we have any contraband like this. Now, this isn't contraband in our country, but in some countries it's viewed as contraband. Things that they are not allowed to have. And many have been put to death and many have been persecuted and, and, and thrown in, in, in jail. We don't, we don't have that here in our country. Yet one of the ways we see in Scripture the great value these individuals had in Christ was their belief. Their belief so much so, their trust so much so that they're willing to lay down their lives for Jesus Christ. First John chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Essentially, those who believe on Jesus Christ alone for salvation hath eternal life. Those who reject it, don't. Now, I don't know whether or not Simon ever did get saved or those others that we are not made aware of that were at that meal that questioned Jesus Christ in his giving of forgiveness towards this woman. But we do know of one. We do know of one that received salvation. It was that woman. We see that in verse 50 of Jesus Christ telling her, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. Belief leads to great value. You know, Christ is the most valuable gift we could ever receive. You could look at everything in this life, everything that this life has to offer, and he is greater than all. Those things pale in comparison to him. 
The Bible talks about, uh, and, and again, I'm going to paraphrase this, you know, I, I, not word for it, but, uh, you know, what have man to profit if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Hey, what profit is there if you go from this life into the next and end up in an eternity in hell? Hey, you might have had everything available to you here. You might have had all the great world worth, yet it's nothing. Nothing. It's all going to burn up someday. Belief leads to great value. Our belief in Jesus Christ leads us to see him as valuable. He's valuable. Number four. This is the last point. God can be moved to action based on our value of him. God can be moved to action based on our value of him. Verses 47 through 48, actually 47 through the end of the chapter, Jesus is addressing Simon and the others there. He says, Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many. You know, they didn't, they didn't tell him about her sins. He, he addressed them, say, hey, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. And then we see him tell her, thy faith has saved thee, go in peace, in verse number 50. God can be moved to action based on our value of him. You know, in our lives, we go back to the day that we got saved. When our heart turned towards him, and our heart desired him, and we saw the fact, hey, there's nothing else that I can accept in this life that is going to help me get to heaven other than him. It moved us to request of him for salvation. Our belief. The Bible tells us, Romans 10, 9 through 13, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Hey, folks, can I stop there just for a minute? Verse number 12. You know, I don't mean to get preachy on you, but I want you to help understand God loves everyone. God desires everyone to get saved. There's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. It's a heart matter. I, I met someone recently, recently that I, I talked to for about an hour, and they, these individuals essentially believe that if, you are, uh, 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 that if you do not do X, Y, and Z and are a part of their church along with Christ, you can't go to heaven. You know, I'm pretty sure that the Bible says whosoever. Not if you go to Open Bible Baptist Church. It's Jesus Christ that saves. It's not a skin issue. Red and yellow, black and white, they're precious in his sight. The Bible tells us, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever means me. Whosoever means you. Whosoever means everyone. Isaiah 55, verse 6 and 7, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. You know, we, we are quickly, I've been talking to several individuals. I think everyone in here would agree. Just watch the news. Times are quickly, quickly, quickly changing. And not for the better. I honestly believe we are closer than ever before to Christ's return. You say, well, when is it going to happen, preacher? I don't know. Could happen in my lifetime, could happen in my kid's lifetime, my grandkid's lifetime. I don't know. That's between God and, that, that, and his son. When God tells his son to come back, then we'll know. But we're not guaranteed tomorrow. The Bible tells us that. And Isaiah gives us the understanding to seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Folks, we're only guaranteed now. Now is the time to look at and consider his value. 
when it comes down to salvation. Now is the time to consider his value when it comes down to a relationship. Let me give you some things as a final illustration, and then I'll conclude. Longfellow could, take a, could, could, Longfellow could take a worthless sheet of paper, write a poem on it, and make it worth $6,000. It's pretty genius. Rockefeller could sign his name to a piece of paper and make it worth millions of dollars. It's capital. Uncle Sam can take gold, stamp an eagle on it, and make it worth $20. Well, that's a lot more than that now, you know, but that's money. You know, if you get, hey, if you ever find the single eagles or the single, uh, the double eagles that were confiscated back in the day, those are worth millions now. Uh, but a, a mechanic can take material that is worth only $5 and make it worth 50 or triple that in our economy right now. You know, that's skill, if you will. An artist can take 50 cent piece of canvas, paint a picture on it, and make it worth a thousand. That's art. God can take a sinful life, wash it in the blood of Christ, put his spirit in it, and make it a blessing to humanity. That's salvation. That's salvation. What's, what's a value? And folks, I am not by any means putting down that, hey, that money is not necessary, or that wealth is evil. No, that's not, that's not the case. You know, money's a tool. Money's amoral. In itself, it has no will of its own. But evil people do evil things with money. What I'm getting at is the fact of value. What is of most value? What would we consider to be of the most value based on this list? A painting? A signature? Maybe some uh, uh, monetary worth in something we own? Or is our most valuable possession the salvation? that God has given to us. Our value of God can lead to loss or gain. Do we value him like this sinful woman? If we are honest, we all need him because we're no better than this woman. You know, when I, when I read, read that passage this week, and I've read that passage multiple times, uh, I, I got a little choked up. Because I understand that, yes, yeah, that maybe that woman has made a lot of mistakes in her life, but I've made mistakes. You know, I've done wrong. That I'm no better than this woman is. How much value do we put in God? She valued him, desired him so much. She had such great worth in him to seek him out and such great action towards him in her faith. How much do we value him in the pursuit of him? A relationship with him, a life led by him, valuable to us. Is it valuable? Those that are here today that may not be saved, can I help you to understand this morning that God loves you? God cares about you. God does not desire you to go an eternity, to an eternity in hell separated from him. But he does not force salvation upon you. He simply gives you the opportunity to accept his gift what is a gift? It's something that's bought and paid for for someone, for, for someone else. If you were to pay for it yourself, it would no longer be a gift. God wants, you to give you, wants to give you the gift of eternal life, paid for by his only begotten son, Jesus. His son's blood as a gift. So that you would not have to go and be separated from him. He wants you to become a part of his family. Would you consider Christ today? Would you consider allowing someone to take a Bible and, and share with you from the Bible how you can know for sure that heaven will be your home? Those of us that have accepted Christ as our Savior, is salvation the only value that we put in God? You know, I, I wonder sometimes, and again, I, don't get me wrong, because I've been this individual. The only value I had in God at, at, at a couple of times in my life was the, the fact that, hey, I, I got salvation. That's good enough. I'll be able to go to heaven someday. That's the only value I had in him. I wonder sometimes if that's how we approach God in, our, in, our, in Christianity. You know, we can make the decision to value him and his influence in all areas of our life. And not just for salvation alone. How much do you value God?
Let's not devalue our God, but let's deepen our value for him as we grow in our relationship with him. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to take a look, Lord, at the story of Simon, your son Jesus, and this woman, Lord, that the Bible describes as being a sinner, doesn't list her name, doesn't really list, you know, what she had done as sins. We can surmise through history and some of the information given that she probably was uh, a, a woman of ill repute. Lord, that doesn't matter. Lord, what matters is what was shown through the heart of this woman towards your son Jesus. The great humbleness of spirit. Lord, the great desire to be near him. Lord, and what was received by him, that forgiveness, Lord, that eternal life through her faith. That great value shown. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to value you, not only for salvation, Lord, but to see that in anything else in life, Lord, that our relationship with you is much more valuable than anything else that we could receive here. Lord, because the things that we can receive here are going to pass away someday. We can't take it with us. Lord, help us to show you by our actions how much we value you. Lord, help us to love you like you love us. Father, if there's something, Lord, that is in the way of a relationship with you, that's in the way of us, Lord, uh, uh, seeking you, Lord, reveal that to us. Help us to understand, Lord, where you want us to make adjustments. Lord, I know it's easy, and I, I could say this from my own experience, to allow things to get in the way of a relationship with you, to put things more valuable in some instances than you. Lord, help us to just respond to your Holy Spirit, Lord, how you want us to respond. Lord, for your glory, for your sake. Father, we thank you for loving us. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for being able to be, live in this country, Lord, where we can be a part of a church service like this, to have a copy of your word like we do. You surely are merciful and gracious. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you'd help us respond how you'd like us to. We pray these things in your son Jesus Christ's name. Amen.